Oh boy, you are lucky today. Yes, we are the number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast in the world, but here's why you're lucky. We give things away every single episode on YouTube. This is the biggest giveaway we've ever done. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours underneath this video. Make it a good one. If we pick your comment, here's what you win. You win the Shredded Summer Bundle. This includes MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Prime, MAPS Hit, and you get the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. You get all of those for free if you win this contest. Turn on your notifications, subscribe to this channel, so you get notified when we post these videos so you can win all kinds of cool stuff. And one more thing before we start the podcast, we are running a 50% off sale on a few things. MAPS Anabolic is half off. The Shredded uh, Summer Bundle is 50% off. You can find those at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code April Special. All right, enjoy the podcast. Adam, thanks for coming back. Uh, a lot has happened since we had you on the show last time. When we had you on the show last time, we were like in like full on lockdown. Gyms were not available. Nobody was open. Yeah, yeah, and now things are starting to move. Uh, what's going on? What what are the what are the rules look like so far? Yeah, I felt like last time I was here, we couldn't even use the restroom without asking for permission, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, listen, it's been an absolutely insane year, both in our industry and let's just face it around the globe. And it's been so interesting to watch how everybody's handled it, right? Whether it's political, from a political point of view, from a, um, an organizational or corporate point of view, um, all the way to entrepreneurs. The good news is, man, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We're coming out of it. And, and you know, a lot of people are feeling very, very bullish. But now's the time. I, you know, I, I think when I, when I, you know, just quickly, when I, when I think about everything that's been accomplished in our industry, it's been incredible. And I had an opportunity to travel throughout the U S and I've been talking to a lot of people over the last three months and listen, hats off to you guys, because almost in every conversation I'm talking to my trainers and my coaches and you guys get brought up the service that you guys provide to the trainers out there and the, in the, uh, so much of our fitness industry I think it's more impactful than you guys know. So congratulations to you guys for the impact that you guys have. Um, but listen, what have we learned from, from COVID and this pandemic? It's stuff that I never really thought of scientifically until we went through this experience, right? And there's one, the big O word, obesity. Mm -hmm. You don't really understand what obesity does to people to community, to your, um, your psyche. There's, there's so many challenges around that. And then as we started looking at the data from COVID-19, what did we see? We, we saw that you, know, you were 10 times more likely to die if you, were, if you, were, you know, had a BMI of 40 or above. Um, and then the percentage of population that's obese is just absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when I started thinking about this and I started thinking about you guys, I'm like, we have to start consolidating together as an industry um, and as experts in the media to get out there and start talking about this evil O word. Because to me, obesity causes cancer. It causes diabetes. It causes anxiety. It doesn't allow you to sleep at night. It's a holistic disability that can impact everybody. And so, you know, I'll give you an update on the business a little bit later, but I, but I, but I felt, you know, A, I wanted to, you know, get your guys' thoughts on what, how you look at obesity. It's the elephant in the room. Yeah. It's the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. Um, we just brought this up on the show the other day that, that the obesity rate is now 45% of Americans are obese, not overweight. Okay? Overweight is over 70%. Yeah, overweight, we're approaching 80%, okay? Which that's, every, you know, almost pretty much almost everybody is overweight. But 45%, nearly half of America is obese, clinically obese. It's, it, this, is how, this is how big of an issue it is. If you look at, um, if you compare our life expectancy and health to other developed nations, uh, for example, uh, compare us to uh, Italy or France would be an example, they smoke cigarettes at such high rates in comparison to us, and yet we have worse health. That's how bad obesity is for you. Cigarettes, you're better off. Not, not encouraging people to go smoke cigarettes, by the way, but you're better off uh, working out and being lean and smoking cigarettes than you are uh, being overweight and not smoking. That's how bad it is for your health. And then you mentioned COVID, 
It's the number one risk factor for uh, severe symptoms of COVID. Of all the risk factors, it's the number one, and it probably has to do with the, the how it affects our body's ability to bl- uh, to clot blood, our circulation, and then of course our- Which you would hope would be a call to arms to really focus on bettering your health and improving your health, right? And and trying to you know reduce the amount of obesity that we're seeing. So um, from your perspective, you know, when you think about obesity, what the the core cause of obesity, obviously we know we have the modern day conveniences. We know that we have fast food that's growing at record levels. Mm -hmm. And we know that um, technology is reducing movement. But is there other things that you guys attribute to obesity? Oh, yeah. If I, I, I can hammer two, there's two nails that are almost entirely responsible for the obesity epidemic. One is uh, the, the processed food, um, just how much processed food is now in our diet. So we used to blame too much fat on obesity. Then, uh, then we figured out, oh, that's not the problem. Uh, we think it's too much carbs. Too many carbs are causing obesity. And then we figured out, oh, no, that's not the issue. The issue is that our diets now are comprised of a majority of hyperpalatable, heavily processed foods, which encourage us to overeat. There's some actually really, really good studies now that show, and these are remarkably well-done studies, the crossovers, where they'll take groups of people, they'll, they'll, ba- they'll make sure the macros – uh, are pretty matched for both of them. And then they'll let them eat as much as they want. The only difference is one group has uh, unlimited access to heavily processed foods. The other group has unlimited access to whole natural foods. They'll let them eat and then they'll, they'll, the scientists will count the calories, see what's going on. Then they'll switch them, switch the groups. So it's a very well-made studies. And they find that heavily processed foods on average will increase your consumption by about five to 600 calories a day every single day, right? So that's, a, that's about a pound of fat you can gain essentially in a week or two from those excess calories. So that's number one. Now, the second one is definitely activity related, but people think it's because we don't move enough to burn as many calories as we should. That's actually not true. Our body actually adapts to lots of activity. So our metabolism starts to slow down when we're moving a lot. So it's not that we're not moving enough and burning enough calories. It's that we're not moving enough and we don't have a lot of muscle on our bodies, which is very protective of, uh, of, of it speeds up our metabolism. And it's very protective from the from from food, from sugar, from uh, makes us sensitive to insulin. So we're weak, low muscle, and we eat too much food. Those are the two things. So if you want to counter the obesity epidemic, th- very this is actually quite simple. Maybe not easy, but it's simple. Don't eat a lot of processed food and build some muscle. Those are the two most important. Yeah, the challenging do. part though is mo- modern life is is making that more difficult. Like you alluded to things like you know, fast food and things like Uber Eats and we've got, you know, TV now on our phones. Like, I, I mean, I find myself today as a trainer giving this advice that I never gave this before. Like one of my first things to help somebody with their relationship with food, the first rule I give them before I say, oh, you can't eat this or follow this diet is actually just stop eating in front of your telephone or in front of the TV, just so you can become aware, just become aware of what you're consuming. We're, we're so distracted today with with technology that we can't even sit down and and have a meal with a friend without being on our social media or watching your favorite Netflix show. You add that with what Sal was talking about with processed foods, which were designed to get you to eat more. You're just, people are unaware. And totally. we're inundating our bodies with chemicals from every which direction on top of yep. all that too, which we just uh, found out this study that was pretty alarming. Yeah, now here's some interesting ways that you can combat this. And as trainers, what we got good at, um, and you know this, you've worked in gyms for uh, longer than we have, is you stop pressuring the, the, the mechanics of what to do and you start pressuring uh, behaviors because that's what's more successful. How do we get the right behaviors? One way, this is studies show this by the way, one way to get people to eat better is to get them to exercise. Okay, it's it's a it's it's actually a con- it's a side effect of exercising when people start to work out. But but Sal, going back to the processed food comment, um, and by the way, I think you've worked longer in the gyms than I have. I'm have not, I really? I'm not that old. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but do you think that as people eat processed foods, your body's realizing it's not getting enough nutrients. And so there's something in your body that's triggering the need for more food to try to gain the correct nutrition. It's not the nutrients, believe it or not, although heavily processed foods typically are less nutrient dense. Really what it is, is there's, if you look at all the R and D that goes behind processed foods, processed foods are foods that are in wrappers, boxes, they have a long shelf life. If you look at the the amount of money that's spent on those foods, it's marketing and then it's also how do we make this food 
as palatable as possible, which includes taste, texture, how it feels on your fingers, the way the wrapper sounds when you open it, the color of the box, um, the smell, uh, how long it stays crunchy. I mean, they literally have this down to a science so perfect. I'll give you an example. Let me give you an example. Let's say I gave you, uh, let's say I took uh, six potatoes and boiled them, plain potatoes and boiled them, put them in front of you. So you got six whole big potatoes right in front of you. And I said, eat these all, no salt, no butter, plain. Can you finish these in the next 10 minutes? Probably, you'd probably be very difficult. It's, it's, uh, you'd gag, right? I gave you a, ba a bag of Lay's potato chips. Could you eat that in 10 minutes? Same amount of potatoes. It's because one is hyper palatable and it, it, it literally hijacks your natural system of satiety, which we all have. Our body naturally will tell us, this is why when you have a big dinner, let's say you go Thanksgiving, you eat a big dinner and you're stuffed, and you're like, all right, I can't eat another bite. And then they pull out dessert. And for some reason, you can eat a little bit more. You're literally messing with that system novelty. of satiety. Right. Yeah. So these food manufacturers, that's what they're trying to do. In fact, if you look at all the categories of foods in the supermarket, including health foods, the top sellers are not the top sellers in health food, for example, because they're the healthiest. The top selling protein bar, the top selling protein powder, the top selling green powder is the, the ones that taste the best. That's, that's what sells the products. And so we end up eating these foods that make us eat more. You're screwed. You're not, it's going to be very, very challenging to eat the appropriate amount when you eat these kinds of foods. And then you add to that a slow metabolism, body that's not sensitive to insulin, low muscle, weak body, and you're going to get fat. You're just going to get fat and it's going to cause, and it causes a lot of problems. So, so guys, what, you know, as, and I, you know, I have my perspective, but when you think about the general population out there and you think about the amount of trainers that are working with that population, what's the best way in your opinion for those trainers to, to socialize this with their clients? Oh, so here's the thing about trainers is they, they have the ability to make the greatest impact of anybody else, if there's anybody in, uh, in, in, in the world that can help solve this problem, it's really good coaches and trainers. A good trainer or a good coach uh, can fundamentally change someone's life in terms of health better and more effectively than anybody else. Why? Because uh, some people, people who don't know this, uh, they think a trainer is just somebody who tells you what to do and gets you to work out. In reality, a trainer is a guide. Yeah. They're, they're like the Sherpa, you know, guiding you to the top of the mountain. They're like a behavioral therapist. Absolutely. And that's what train, that's what really good trainers do. So, so what do really good trainers do? They meet you where you're at. They don't, you know, if you tell them, I, I can only work out once a week, the trainer, a good trainer will say, no problem. We'll make that work. A good trainer will get you to, uh, will communicate to you in an effective way to make you, to get you to the point where you can make fundamental lifelong changes. A good trainer doesn't just focus on motivation because motivation is fleeting. A good trainer understands how to build discipline and teach their client to build discipline. A successful trainer gets a person to change their life forever, whether they're with the trainer or not. So that's why we talk to trainers all the time. You know, my, my view on this as I'm navigating through the industries, you have this kind of $10 a month trainer, right? That gets hired for minimum wage and they take people through a, a few pieces of equipment and cardio and they call it a day. And then you have trainers that are really meaningful with a huge value proposition. And I think training is becoming so much more holistic than ever before. Absolutely. Because you have, of course, you know, cardio manipulation, muscular manipulation, um, but also when you throw in food, like, like you're so passionate about and you fill in nutritional gaps with supplements and then you start getting into recovery. I mean, listen, the days of LeBron James and Tom, Tom Brady, it's because of the recovery that they do with their body. Right. So when you start talking about compression and you start talking about cryo and you start talking about hydration and, and those variables, that's to me what makes trainers great. And what you just talked about is that emotional connection that where trainers will actually listen to their client and meet them where they need to be and then guide them. That's the X factor. Yeah. So the reason why I get excited when I hear you talk like this, Adam, is you run uh, a very large uh, gym company, right? UFC gyms, uh, which you know we've talked about on the podcast before. And there was a trend there for a while where gyms stopped investing in time and money in good coaches. It, mm -hmm. it, it became... About the, there was a second there where, where we started at 24 Hour Fitness where it seemed like they were moving in the direction of really investing in trainers. Then they seemed to reverse, and it seemed like the trainers were 
an afterthought and it was really about just getting people in the door and, and then who cares. And we all knew this, that this was a huge mistake. It's exciting to hear someone like you who has all these clubs talk about trainers this way because you get it. Um, talk about that process. What, how do you guys look at your trainers with your gyms? What do they mean to you? Man, it, it's a great question. And <clears throat> it's our core value proposition. It's who we are. It's our personality. And, you know, you, as you look at candidates to become trainers and coaches, you guys know this, it's the ability to emotionally connect with the consumer, but it's also the ability to also control your ego and have the desire to continue to learn, learn and learn so you can become the best at what you do. And so we, we have a rigorous process and, and, you know, listen, I have, I have, I think, and I'm a little bit um, biased here, but I think I have the best personal training team in the industry right now. And it's because of the process that we go through and how we select the trainers and the coaches. MMA brings a whole different variable to it, right? Mm -hmm. Because MMA is almost a religion. And so when you intersect science-based training, when you intersect MMA and things like jujitsu and other forms of MMA, it's beyond just the push and pull. And so the personality has to be right on the profile of the, of the, of the trainer then there's got to be certifications that are associated that are credible. None of these, I'm going to pay $19 for a certification. It has to be a legitimate certification that makes sense. And then once those boxes are checked, we have a UFC gym certification that's five full days. But instead of just giving them a piece of paper, they have to pass a physical test of exactly what we'd expect our consumers to do. They got to be able to do it themselves. They got to be action driven they got to get it, they got to go through it, and they got to feel the emotion of what it takes to be a great client. If, you're not, if you don't understand what it takes to be a great client, you cannot be a great trainer. Yeah, you, you mentioned uh, martial arts. Um, you know, I, I did martial arts as a kid, judo, and then I did jujitsu uh, as a young adult. And you kind of look like Von Damme. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> my wife had a crush on him when she was younger, by the way. Um, so, you know, uh, with, martial, right with martial arts. With martial arts, exactly. <laughs> with martial arts, martial arts isn't just about, you know, learning how to choke someone out or arm lock someone or knock someone out. Uh, martial art, there's an art to. Uh, to what you're doing. And a lot of it is uh, the philosophy and the attitude around it. And it, it, it very much, in my experience, the best coaches I ever worked with, the best people I ever worked with, they were very similar to the best trainers that I ever worked with in the fitness industry in terms of their attitude around what they were doing. It was much more than, hey, I'm just going to show up and work out. It was it, it was much more than that. It was, it was their life. And I've heard people refer to jiu-jitsu as like a philosophy and a way of living. Um, do you see that kind of crossover with your coaches, with their clients? And I do, you know, the, the days of old, and let's just go back to the 24 hour days. Listen, I think 24 hour at its, at its core, it was the most innovative company in its space back in the nineties. And then as things started to evolve, we figured out functional training, right? And really, I, I truly think CrossFit was a game changer for fitness. I think at that time. I mean, it, it set a, a bar very high to focus on functional fitness. And as this UFC gym opportunity came to me via uh, Mark Mastroff and Lorenzo Fertitta, Dana White, we, at that point, I didn't understand MMA. I didn't under, I wasn't like you and, and, and grew up with it. I, uh, uh, I was more of the traditional sports guy. Um, and I didn't really understand how MMA would socialize into fitness. But then you go watch these guys. You go watch these guys and how they prepare for a fight. And it is the most unique experience that I've ever been involved with because you have eight, eight to 10 coaches in a camp. One focuses on their conditioning. One focuses on wrestling. One focuses on jujitsu. One focuses on stand-up. One focuses on diet. One is a shrink to get their head right. Right, So you have this entire camp of people all designed to spiritually move you to a place where when you walk into that octagon, you feel invincible, your confidence level is at an all-time high, and your body is prepared to not only dish out damage, but also to take damage. And to me, that's incredibly powerful. And so if you can put that into a gym experience, not to say that I'm going to put you in the octagon and right. knock you out. But if you can prepare your mind and your body like that, and you can holistically bring together traditional fitness with what's so great about MMA-inspired fitness, 
you have something very special. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. When when I first heard of your of your gems, I thought that's gonna be interesting. What that what's that gonna be like? But the environment is definitely how you explain it. It's uh, I remember which one did we go to first? Because we all went to one. Uh, Sunnyvale. To, it was a Sunnyvale. Sunnyvale. Yeah. We all went into one, and we all left saying uh, that's one of the best gyms uh, I think I've been in. So you guys definitely have put together. No, I love the facilities. I, I do have a question, Adam. About you, you brought up something that uh, reminded me. You, you took me back to 24 days that I remember when they got rid of this, and it sounds like you guys have implemented this in UFC, and that's the the week long course of training. It used to be called 24 Hour Fitness University when I when I was a kid coming through it, and. Uh, was extremely valuable uh, to me and was extremely valuable to me later on as I was a manager and managed trainers that were coming through that they got this at least baseline teaching of our philosophy before they came in and they completely eliminated that. So one, uh, you were around for when that was eliminated, right? So one, I'd like to hear uh, you tell me why they did and your thoughts on that. And then two, why did you guys decide to implement it? And I imagine that it cost money and is, is expensive for the company to do it. Yeah, you know, listen, I, at that point in 24, it, that was above my pay grade. And so you just do what you're directed to do. But I'll just tell you what typically ruins great companies are boardroom decisions. Because you lose the authenticity and the experience of the way the team member looks at it. So we knew somebody like you that went through this week-long process on the university. That experience is something you'll always remember. That's right. What a boardroom says is I'm spending $1,000 to take somebody through. If I do that times uh, 2,000 trainers, it's X amount of money. I can put that straight to the bottom line. They don't understand the ripple effect that it can have. Right. And so, listen, we're not here to make, uh, UFC Gym's not here to turn around and make a quick dollar. We're here to create a legacy for a long time. This is not about how much money I make today. This is about what kind of legacy we can create for tomorrow. And so in reinvesting back into our coaches and having these one week certifications, having the ability to work with the UFC PI, Performance Institute, with guys like Forrest Griffin are amazing because he has a whole different way of looking at fitness and looking at how people should condition and, and get trained. Um, and so, you know, I think that the entire industry has to relook at this and we have to relook at how we're investing into our key people and our key personnel that represent our industries and our brand. How mm. did you guys, uh, cause a lot of big brands, uh, not only didn't they get hit hard by the shutdowns, but they're, they're a lot of them bankrupt. How did you guys survive that, that whole process? Cause that, I mean, you're literally forced to not do business and there's not much you could do around that. How'd you guys stay afloat? So I'm happy to get into the political conversation in a second if you'd like. But <laughs> mm -hmm. listen, it, it, you know, from my position, it was one of the most stressful times of my life because I have a responsibility to thousands of team members. I have a responsibility to a significant amount of mess members and customers. And I know we have a special brand but every fitness company around the globe, for that matter, every service-based business around the globe was going through the same thing where you had greedy landlords wanting the rent and you had a lot of different challenges, whether it's from a political environment or whether it's just the circumstances of COVID that did not allow you to open your gyms. And so um, not only did we survive that, but we doubled the size of the company which is incredibly interesting. Wow. And, and I got to tell you, the, the, the man, Mark Mastroff, um, stepped up and, and with our private equity, uh, which is Summit Capital, um, those guys worked together and they said, Adam, we want you to go double the size of the company. We want you to reinvest back into the company wow. and we want the brand better than ever before. And we realize that you're not going to take in much revenue over the next six to 12 months. As a matter of fact, Mark, it's interesting, Mark Mastroff, we all know him as a as kind of an icon in the industry. When this thing happened last March, he actually predicted when everybody else was saying 90 days, he predicted it was going to go between 12 and 16 months. And he predicted exactly what we were going to deal with, with the adversity that we went through. So that really helped us having his perspective of how to take a look at this. And then with the support of private equity and the support of an incredible UFC gym team that all had to wear, we all had to wear seven hats, right? We all had to do things that we weren't comfortable doing to make sure that we were leading by example through action to get us to the other side of this. 
And thank God, the light's at the end of the tunnel. We're ready to go. Wow, that's interesting. You know, it's funny uh, when you talk to uh, successful investors. What do they say when there's blood in the ste- streets, right? That's when you buy or whatever. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, you guys saw the opportunity because a lot of your competitors were not going to be able to survive this. And so you're like, let's put ourselves in a position to capitalize on this market share because the demand for fitness is still there. People are, if, if anything, it's growing. I, I, I feel like more people. It's, gr- it's growing. Right. So that's the same. Is that, am I, am I saying the right, am I, is that what it was? You guys were like, look, we're going to position ourselves so that when this comes up, we're ready to go and we'll be able to capture more market share. And it's exactly what we saw. We, we knew there was going to be a tipping point, right? And listen, we're not in the clear yet, but we know what's out there. We know that obesity, exactly everything, the data you just shared with us is a huge, huge concern out there. We know that gyms have shut down, which is also a concern. I don't want gyms to shut down. I want them to be part of the movement. The way I look at it is let's take fitness participation from 23% to 40%. There's enough for everybody. Mm -hmm. We need everybody out there chanting the same message. And so, yeah, the, the opportunity was very clear and visible. The ability to execute off the opportunity is a whole nother issue, right? There, there's a lot of complication around that because you're dealing with real circumstances that have real adversity. And so how you digest that information, how you find the right solution, you have to, you have to think out of the box a little bit. And we've been able to do that. And, you know, the exciting thing is we opened a, a brand new 40,000 square foot gym in Seattle, in Puyallup, Washington, that, that just turned out amazing. Uh, we just opened last weekend, um, or I'm sorry, two weeks ago uh, in Las Vegas, 50,000 square foot indoor outdoor gym in Las Vegas, our first one there. Um, we're about to open the second one on April 10th. Um, last weekend, we opened up in Anaheim, um, City of Industry, and Oxnard, California, all mm-hmm. at the same time. And so we are going to, from a just a company-owned perspective, I'm not counting domestic and international, we're going to open up 17 locations. Wow. Uh, during this period of time, so it's it's been insane. No, I do I do want to get you into the political uh, oh, realm let's, there. Let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do it. Because so, are you part of? It's like the fitness coalition, yes. and so if you could explain kind of who represents that and what kind of fights you guys have been a part of, and what kind of wins uh, you've actually been able to accomplish uh, in this crazy landscape that we have. Yeah, no, I want to I want to compliment the CFA because they um, have done just a fantastic job representing representing the industry. And really, in my opinion, and I don't want to get too controversial here, but my opinion is I I have the ability to view fitness all over the globe because we're developing in 37 countries, right? So Mm -hmm. I know what's going on in Thailand. I know what's going on in Singapore and China and Japan. California was the worst run process in regards to COVID compared to everything that I've seen globally. That's so strange. Yeah, we have such a great governor. I yeah. Never <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know I saw the He's poster. So I, I saw the poster of him in your, uh, in your <laughs> office over there. Right? The, one, the one that we throw just, darts at? Yeah. Well, I started doing my <laughs> hair just like but, him. But, Justin's but, a big fan. Yeah. But, but listen, here's what happened is the CFA, you know, we wanted to be fair. I mean, they they went to, to, to go meet with them and, and it was about a round table and trying to have common ground because we all wanted to do this safe. We understood that initially you have to close the clubs and understand what you're dealing with. Everybody understood that. It's the inconsistency that started to happen that really created the erosion of confidence. Mm-hmm. And so when you say, hey, governor's office, all we want to do is see the data and where and how you're making decisions so we could understand it because we had our own data, right? We had all the key gym operators around the state from 24 to us to InShape to all these other companies provided data about COVID and the percentage of COVID um, um, viruses that happened throughout the, throughout the day and through check-ins. Um, and what we found out is that they have not, they've yet to provide us any data. They don't have any data that, that where they made it, that, that was the basis of the decision. Strange. And so obviously that is a huge amount of concern. If, if we go around making decisions without any data, mm. you're going to put yourself in a lot of, uh, a lot of trouble. And, the decisions of how the governor how the governor made those decisions i don't think they realized the impact it's had on the everyday joe and when i look at my own gyms and i talk to my members around california that haven't been able to work out for a year and they're telling me that they've gained you know 18 to 20 pounds of fat because the average person's gaining between 1 and 2 pounds 
mm. uh, every single month from the inception of COVID all the way through today. When they when they tell me the anxieties that have been that been creating, whether it's self imposed, bottom line is anxieties are picking up. When they tell me that the depression and how high it is. The governor doesn't realize that. The governor's office doesn't realize that. They're just thinking, okay, let's shut down gyms and let's make sure that Costco is open. Let's make sure that, um, you know, all these different um, um, services that they think is essential without any data, let's make sure those are open, but a place where you can actually social, I mean, think about gyms, guys. Don't we already clean gyms? Mm -hmm. Don't we Don't we already set up equipment where it's kind of socially distanced? Because the average machine, guess what? Is six to 10 feet apart. Everything is distance. Don't we already have good ventilation and air circulation? Does that same thing happen at Costco? Yeah. No. No. And also, look, gyms are not there. They and they've been shown now in the data. They're not. They weren't major vectors of uh, of COVID. One of the main reasons is this: look, healthy people go there. I'll tell That's you. What, I, look, <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you something right now. First of all, nobody's weighing that out. Nobody's saying. Okay, this will reduce infections, but what are the consequences? What are the side effects? Nobody's saying that. Uh, there are side effects. There are consequences to some of these policies. And of course, with gyms and, and closing down parks, parks got closed down. People are getting more and more unhealthy. Diabetes and obesity kills more people uh, than anything else. And then, of course, we know how, how much it increases the risk of dying from something like COVID. But here's the big one, okay? You, if you took the average person and they felt a little under the weather, so not full-blown sick, but they're a little bit kind of sick, they're still going to go to dinner with their friend. They're still going to go to the to the mall to go shopping, whatever. They're not going to go to the gym. The first place people don't go when they start to feel a little under the weather is gyms. They just don't go work out. I know this. I manage gyms. Sick people don't show up to my gym to work out. So you have this self-selection bias of people who all feel good enough to work out. So you go to a gym, you're not surrounded by very sick people. That's one of the main reasons why, in my opinion, why we don't we didn't see huge spreads of COVID in gyms. You're, you're, you're so right. There is this common respect in gyms because gyms create community and people know that just don't go to the gym if you don't feel good. Um, whether it's uh, a position of they just don't feel good enough to go or that's the respect for the other members that are there, they, they don't want them to get sick. So I completely agree with you. And I, and I think that um, as we look back on this in a couple of years, we're going to be able to directly look at this and say that, the way this was handled and managed cost people's lives. It cost people's um, um, professional lives to deteriorate in a significant way. Uh, and, it, and it had much more impact than we realize today. Oh, I, I 100% agree with that. Yeah. So, okay, so your gym, some of your gyms are open now, or if not all of them, but with certain restrictions. How has the market response been? It, have you felt like you opened one up and there were people were just like, oh my God, I, I've been waiting for a year to work out or has it been slow? Like what's it been like? There's a huge demand. Really? And, and yeah, it, it's, uh, it's been just incredible to see is that uh, the popularity without having to spend money on marketing, without having to um, do the things that we've typically done in the past around membership acquisition. Um, you know, people are coming back to the gym and they, they feel almost like their, their Liberty is back. Um, and we're seeing customers now that would not have gone to the gym in the past that are now giving it a shot. And so now it's really driven around so far the younger population, right? We're not seeing as much of the senior population enter the, enter the doors. I think that will come as the vaccine continues to, to spread. But uh, so far it's, it's been, we're very optimistic and we're very bullish on where fitness is going. And we think that there's going to be a huge, huge voice uh, inside this industry as we navigate through this, because we're not done with pandemics, you know, they're, they're going to come back and we're going to be much more prepared in the future with a data, but with B making sure we're educating our trainers and our team members and, and everybody else within our circle to be able to handle a situation like this. You mentioned, uh, I think it was a gym in Vegas that's outdoor indoor with these new locations that you're opening up. Are you, is that something you're considering now right. to have a larger outdoor right. area? Because are they designing that in the plans? Yeah. 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 No, it, it, it is. Is, I, I think, um, which is, I mean, in my opinion, that's awesome. I think that's great. Yeah. We have a, we have a gym in, in Costa Mesa. It's owned by Mike Bisbing and Cub Swanson out there. And it, it's uh, half outdoors and half indoors. And it's always performed exceptionally well. Well, when COVID hit the performance doubled because you could for the most part, keep it open. Right. Oh, yeah. And so it was, it was, it was really amazing to see. 
yes, Centennial has in Las Vegas has an outdoor gym, and and yes, City of Industry has an outdoor gym, and yes, Oxnard has an outdoor gym. Yeah, so what we're seeing is members really like that external experience of being able to train outside and or inside based on how the weather is and based on what they feel. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's kind of like a throwback. I remember, uh, I mean, you ever work out at Muscle Beach? I mean, uh, I walked by it. I was a little bit intimidated, but I know you, somebody <laughs> like you probably. Nah, no, it's one. I mean, it, I mean, so it was. Sal uh, can't wait to take yeah. his shirt off. He <laughs> oh, rips it off right It's away. a great time. No, <laughs> but <laughs> people. I, but that makes perfect sense that you guys would then include that in your new plans because if this happens again, at least you'll have that buffer, right? You'll have an open area. Was there anything else that's different now considering what happened that you guys are looking like? Are you training people differently and saying, okay, if this happens again, here's how we're set up? Or are you looking at different plans? Like, is there anything else that's different? Listen, saying. there's, there's, I would say everything's different. It's not just, it's just not one or two things, you know, from the virtual fitness community that everybody's now engaging in um, and how we're setting up to intersect uh, social community with fitness online, I think is a big piece. Um, I think how we train our team to more holistically take care of our consumers, that they're just not a member check-in, that it really is about making sure they're eating, drinking, sleeping, um, going through recovery and training the right way. The way we're educating our team member is is much more enhanced compared to probably pre-COVID. Um, and I think, you know, listen, the obvious the stuff that we all need to make sure that we continue to consider, which is the cleanliness of the facility and making sure that we're keeping maintenance up. You can't take shortcuts anymore. And, and gyms that try to save, save money and make profit through cutting um, maintenance and cutting CapEx and cutting investment back in the cleanliness, they're making a huge mistake because even though we may not be dealing with a pandemic in six months, we're still dealing with um, um, other illnesses and other things, you know, staff infection, other things that you can get if the gym is not clean. Yeah, plus people are aware of the fact that they, they that there was an illness, so now they're probably just more aware of that in general. Well, that's right. That's a great segue for a question that I had for you. Are you familiar with uh, some of the surveys that have been done on what people are saying about working out from home now? Have you followed any of that? I, a little bit, a little bit, yeah. So I, I think uh, maybe Doug, you can pull it up to tell me where it's at uh, right now. But I, I've been following this since now. Obviously, when COVID first hit and everybody was scared to death to even go outside, I'm sure that the rates of how many people said they're going to work out from home was much higher than probably what it's going to be when we feel safer. But there has been a large percentage, and I want to say the number is like forty percent, which is almost half the people that are saying now that they may never return to gyms. Now, is this something that you guys have discussed and how are you guys uh, attacking that from a business point? Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing that I see, you know, 40% of the people are never going to return to a grocery store. You know, it's just, it's it's not reality. And listen, we all know you guys are gym people and you know the importance of social community. And I don't look at the at-home experience as competition at all. It's about how do you complement the at-home experience? Because what I want to do is take my train different mentality. I want to give the consumer the best possible fitness experience that cannot be replicated anywhere else, whether they're at home or whether at another gym inside my four walls. Then what I need to make sure that I do is I'm able to extend that at home. So if they're running late, if the weather's bad, if the tire's flat, they're going to be able to jump online and take a quick class or do a quick workout. And they're going to be able to search thousands of videos to be able to do that. And quite frankly, if they have Peloton, I embrace it. Peloton, grow, expand. Because Peloton, how many modalities is Peloton? Oh. It's one modality, yeah. right? It's cycling. Okay, do whatever you want to do on cycling. And it complements what you're going to do in my gym. Yeah. If you want to do other, if you want to go to YouTube and look at fitness at home, by all means, do it. But that just complements and it navigates the message of how important fitness is. So now instead of speaking to the limited percentage of population to get into gyms, we're speaking to a much broader audience that are now accepting fitness at home. My job is to make sure my value proposition is so unique that you can only get it within my four walls, which makes people both want to work out at home and in the gym. That makes that does make a lot of sense. You you bring up the community atmosphere in gyms, and then you, earlier you brought up CrossFit. This is why CrossFit succeeded so well, is they had that. Like you went in and you were working out with other people. You had that kind of team atmosphere. A lot of modern gyms, I feel like, lost that. Like you go in, put your headphones on, do your workout, and you don't really talk to anybody. So you're almost you're in a public, you know, you're in a, in a private a public gym, but by yourself. UFC gyms are a little bit different because of the class atmosphere, the MMA that's in there. 
it does feel more like that in, that group environment, which is a very powerful. That is one of the most effective ways to keep people consistent. I, I know that. I know people used to show up to work out with me half the time because they just like to say, you know, hang out with me, not necessarily because of the workout. So, and I, I would like to see statistics on that. What percentage of people who work out consistently at home also have a gym membership? Mm-hmm. I did. I know you did too, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I so I wonder what that what that number. No, would look I think like. you bring up a great point, and I, I think that's the right, regardless if it affects a business or not negatively. I think that's the right attitude. Is that um, I think one of the problems of the fitness industry is we've we've been competing with each other for so long. It doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's that's one of the things that in, inspired the uh, the show was that. We wanted to come out and, and share all the positive benefits of all these different modalities. And there's plenty of obese, <laughs> unhealthy people for everybody in the space to eat. And instead of competing with each other and saying, my modality is better than your modality, mm-hmm. why not encourage people to dabble in all of it and see what works best Just, for them? Yeah, meet people where they're at. I think it's it's great that they know now they have an option, you know, if those circumstances, you know, come up again or like there's more lockdowns or whatever, like, you know, people are now at least savvy to, to know like, okay, I have an answer. I can do this at my house, but I also love the gym experience and I don't think that's going to go away. Well, isn't it crazy, you know, in 1999, 2000, when 16 people out of a hundred were working out in a gym and we were going insane on competition. We were beating each other up. We were price, you know, cutting each other 16 out of a hundred people with that. That means, and I'm not good at math here, but I'll try. That means 84 people had, they weren't involved in fitness and we weren't looking at that opportunity to, to grow the platform. And so, you know, the other thing I'll talk about on, on, on the connectivity here is there is something to accountability. There's a something to it. And I don't care who you are. You are not inspired. You're not having fun and you're not being held accountable at home. So you're going to choose days that you just don't feel like doing it because you're not in the mood. You're going to choose to give up a little bit sooner than you should. And let's face it, when you go to the right gym that's in your trade area, and you're inspired to work out with other people around you, that becomes kind of like what you're talking about, the CrossFit effect, right? The CrossFit effect was that social connectivity where people were holding each other accountable to showing up at the gym and then inspiring one another to achieve better yeah. results. Well, this is a debate that we have all yeah, the time. This is the, you're, you're coming from my point right here. Yeah, and, and we have this discussion all the time, but I will say this, uh, a big part of what you're saying has to do with the leadership in the gym. And what I mean by that is, you know, I've run gyms that were old, you know, that were not nice, not as nice as my competitors' gyms, but we did better because of me and the team in there. What kind of people are you looking for to work in and run these gyms? What kind of managers are you looking for? Because I feel like that makes the biggest impact. I mean, you guys have nice gyms, nice equipment. It's all fancy, big, all that stuff, but it doesn't matter if the team isn't the right team. Well, I was going to come at you with a job offer right after that. <laughs> <laughs> He's uh, expensive as fuck. I know, I know, I know. I got to model that in. I got to pay him way too much, dude. You, you, you got a new mean, book out? Yeah, he says shit's so I inflated. Know, I know, I know. <laughs> Listen, there's, there's two very important letters when you start looking at leaders. It used to be back when you and I were a GM at 24 Hour. It was who worked the hardest and and who had the most amount of passion and, and you know, could sell. Mm. Today, those are those elements are certainly important, right? Discretional attitude is always critical, but it's it's EQ, emotional intelligence. You have to be able to understand the filter of what other people, the way other people are looking at things. And if you don't understand and comprehend that, you will never ever speak to the mass audience. You're only going to speak to a selective few. Leadership is 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 the most important element of any gym. In 2021, you have to be able to inspire others around you to accomplish things that they did not think was possible. Yeah, that makes it. It makes a huge difference. What about the atmosphere with the with the members? Are you encouraging people to go out on the floor, talk to people, to get people engaged? Like I said earlier, a lot of gyms you go in, you got your headphones on, and it's like it's like you're by yourself. I would imagine you guys are trying to have a different kind of atmosphere. Look, you know, I, I had a I had a conference call last week, and I told everybody to put their pins down and to not take notes. And the only thing I wanted to do was talk about having fun. That's it. I wanted to figure out how can we have more fun in our clubs. 
Uh, let's not talk about KPIs and drivers and measures and all the typical conference call stuff that you do, the minutia. Let's just say, how, how the hell are we going to have fun tomorrow? How are we going to have fun in a different way than we, that we haven't experienced before? You got to get people thinking about fitness in a creative way, and you got to give them the right autonomy and trust to do so. You can't script everything out. You can't say, hey, from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., here's exactly what you're going to do every second of the day. I got to go to Sal, and I got to say, Sal, you are an incredible leader. You inspire me. Here's our objectives as an organization. Here's how we think we can get there. But I'd like to have your slant, your personality, your style. And I want you to figure out how to make sure every team member has fun because if they have fun, who else has fun? The customer. Yeah. It all associates together. Uh, where were you, man, when we were at the end of our careers running gyms? I would have loved that. I always got the, you got to fit in this box. Sorry. Yeah. Can't do it your way. Got to do it this way. Highlight the planner. Fill out the yeah. Exactly. Like, yeah. ah, that'd be crazy. <laughs> so, okay. So with some of these limitations um, and restrictions, I think what uh, some gyms in California can be what? 10% indoor, 20% indoor? Yeah. There's some deal? counties that are up to 25% now, okay. but it, it's going to continue to get better. And listen, the, the nice thing is when you have some decent square footage, you can basically operate as normal. I was just going to say, how does that, how do you organize something like that? Does it, do people have to have appointments or do they show up and then you tell them we're full? What's, what does that look like? You know, I, I can't really speak to the low cost gyms. The low cost Cost gyms, you know, the more of the philosophy is how many members can you get in a gym at one time, right? right? And the premium value proposition gyms, you just don't have the same type of crowds and floods of people. You know, you have, uh, when you pay a little bit more dues and you have a more premium experience, um, you just, you don't get as many people showing up at one time. So we have no issues. We, we're, we're in a good spot. Oh, on, wow. on that note, do you, do you have any predictions? Do you think that we're going to see any more fallout in the gym industry? Like, do you predict any of these low, low cost gyms? Do you see any of them mm. filing for bankruptcy? Or are we going to see anything else? Is Orange Theory going to survive? <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, I do think they'll still survive. They're, they're, they're a good brand. I mean, I think, you know, listen, everybody is in kind of the same position. And and it's all how you you deal with the current economic challenges, right? We, what we're seeing on data is about 78% of our members came back. Um, and so I know some of the data says 59% plan the return, but, but we saw more than we expected to come back initially. And then we put a plan together to make sure that we get at least 95% back that were there prior to COVID happening. And is there a risk in the future? Of course there is. But the people that don't take on and embrace that risk are the people that are going to fail. You have to know the risk. You have to know the choppy waters to try to navigate through. And if you run the business correctly, you try to stay as healthy as you can. I like the odds of success, but there is no certainty in any climate. And, you know, I mean, listen, what do we, what kind of debt did we create for this country? Uh, over the last twelve months, I mean, I don't. Was it I just too, bought. I just bought more Bitcoin today. I stopped paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it, I got to get your perspective on this Dodge. My son's trying to teach me Dodgecoin. Oh, I, I've been, I don't oh, know about man. that, but uh, but I mean, you're talking what two point five trillion dollars or something yeah. um, absurd, and and that goes back into the economy, and it's not going to be easy. I don't care if 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 business and members came back to a hundred percent level where it was pre COVID you still have the adversity of the economic challenges with people trying to raise minimum wage with people with, with laws changing. And, and I mean, listen, I'm, I'm dealing with a club in, in Texas. I'm trying to open, I'm trying to figure out if I should even, if I should name the city cause it could hurt me, but uh, I'm dealing with a club in Texas and, and all I want to try to do is open a presale center, a business office that's this size with three desks in it to just sell memberships, a preview center for the gym. The city came out and said, no, you cannot open because we don't have a professional diagram. Okay, well, let me give you a diagram. We inserted the diagram, provided it to the city. Uh, you can't open because there is not three thermostats located in these three areas. We dealt with that. They came back with something else. So cities now, because of COVID, there's a lot of city employees that are involved with permits that are trying to justify jobs by rat red tagging oh, wow. everything, wow. right? So, wow. so it, it, there's there's dimensions of this COVID that is it's not just the simple what's in front of our face. There's the extension of everything else that's around us that's creating challenges Man. to get back to normal. Wow, Adam, do you guys franchise? We do. Okay, good. That's good to know because one day uh, we we've talked about owning a gym. Yeah. I my money's on you guys. 
Yeah, well, no, sure. I, I, listen, I, I appreciate it, but we're, we're going to stay humble and, and we're going to stay very empathetic to the team member and the, and the customer. I do believe we have something unique and special as it continues to translate globally. But there's adversity. There's adversity in front of us, but with the team and, and with people like you, that you guys that are driving the fitness passion out there across um, the, the world, really, I like our chances of success as an industry. I'm not just talking about UFC, Jim. I want to see this industry prevail and be incredibly successful. Agreed. Same same yeah. here. Thanks for coming yeah. on, man. My Appreciate pleasure. It. Always good to see you guys. Thank you, you very much. Yeah, Look, you thanks. can go to mindpumpfree.com and download some of our guides. They cost nothing. They're absolutely free. And you can also find all of us on social media. Justin on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsal. And Adam at mindpumpadam. I do want the pizza. You know, I do. I say I can't because I can't because I'm following a diet and I'd be lying to myself if I said I don't want it. And that's why this takes a little bit more practice. And how do you get from I don't want it instead of saying I can't have it? You have to start to learn to connect how your body feels 